88% of the folks exporting in the state are small business. So when we start talking about global trade, despite the fact that national headlines around TPA or TPP often talk about the big folks, the reality is that, the statistical reality, is that this is entirely about small businesses and big businesses working together. So if you've attended this event in the past, and just out of curiosity, if I could take a casual little side break here, how many people in this room have either been to Japan or are currently doing business in Japan? Significant number. In the past, this event has often been a culmination debrief of the trip and a discussion about what we learned. But going forward, one of the things we're trying to do at the state is to broaden the audience base that gets engaged in this Japan dialogue with Oregon and be able to start to better coordinate as a state the business development trips and missions that go on going forward so that doing business in Oregon isn't just a one-day seminar in Tokyo once a year in April, but Oregon establishes its presence in Japan for a solid week with all of the businesses, NGOs, government officials building out their own unique agendas that come back at the end of that week so that when we leave, Japan knows Oregon is here to do business. So you'll notice some changes in this event from past year. We'll talk about the Japan trade mission like we have done in the past, uh, but our main objective is to build this awareness going forward and to help spread that message and to help coordinate those activities. Two great examples today up on, actually those samples are over there, Renova hardwood bicycles. These are incredible. I, I met these guys when we were at the, the Japan Friendship Association of Oregon. The Friendship Association of Oregon. And they told me that, and I hadn't known that they were on the trip, and they told me that they made these bikes out of wood. And I must have asked three times, these made out of what? I'm thrilled to see that they're here today. Uh, Egg Press also, uh, greeting cards made here in Portland, exporting and selling that product in Tokyo and throughout Japan. Another great story of small businesses based here in Oregon. We're helping assist them get overseas to sell that product because at the end of the day, if we're really interested in driving job growth, one of the best ways to do that is to drive top line revenue for small businesses. The only way a business can add jobs is if they make a profit. And there's only two ways really that add up in the formula to make profit, drive revenue and keep costs in control. When it relates to government intervention to try and assist in that endeavor to help them grow jobs, we have to be a partner in helping them drive their top line revenue on that P&L. And global trade is entirely focused, our, our strategy is entirely focused on helping these companies drive that top line revenue growth going forward. Oops. So some numbers for you. There are 6,000 companies in the state that export. 88% of them are small businesses. And we hit a record this last year at $21 billion of total state exports from Oregon overseas and around the world. These are big numbers, and it's not just the Nikes and Intels. It's almost entirely the small business community that's driving huge portions of its growth. But what's not reflected in this room, which I want to point out, is agriculture and the role that agriculture plays in the state's trade export numbers. A lot of what's focused on in the metropolitan area is food processing, especially when it relates to Japan, and semiconductor and electronics manufacturing, two historic stalwart industries operating here within this state. Outside the metropolitan area, outside the Cascades, or east, if you will, of Bend, agriculture continues to be the number one driver of exports. And especially in Japan, the food processing value-added agriculture is a really important part of our value proposition overseas, and particularly in Japan. So a lot of you already know this. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have showed up to an event on global trade and exports. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the actual mission component of what we did in April and how we're evolving it going forward with your participation and your help. For those of you who don't know, this is the world's third largest economy we're talking about. And we sometimes forget this, and I'd like to remind, Oregon is a very, very small dot on a very big map. I know we're great, 
I know we're very cool. I know we do amazing things. But at the end of the day, we're a very, very small dot with a pretty small voice in the global economy. So we have to aggressively work every day to make our voice heard as we go overseas. There are 124 Japanese companies doing business in this state today. As a result of this mission, there are three new companies in the pipeline that I hope that number will read 127 by the time we get together next year. And I'm looking at one of our business development officers over there as he's shaking his head. Yes, Sean, we will. <laughs> There's 30 Oregon companies doing business in Japan on the reverse side as we speak. Collectively, these employ thousands of people. Electronics and food industry is a huge portion of that. And we're exporting $1.6 billion of products and services to Japan every year of the $21 billion number. This is our fourth largest trading partner of all overseas targets. And because we can't be everything to everyone all over the globe all the time, which oftentimes trade missions and trips and tr strategy becomes as to where do, can we go visit next, the reality is we have to be very targeted and focused on where we put our time and energy and money. And Japan has that starting point, not just in the numbers, but in the culture and the relationship that make it a competitive advantage for us. So this seminar, this trip, evolved about five or six years ago under the leadership of a small group of folks, including Doug Smith, Charlie Alcock. Every year, correct me if I have the facts wrong on this, the Friendship Association of Oregon in Tokyo, which is great, a Tokyo, one of the world's largest metropolitan areas, has a Friendship Association of Oregon pretty special, has an annual meeting. At that meeting six or seven years ago, how many people attended that meeting? One. So we had one friend from here, from here. Yes, one, one Oregon friend. This year we went back, we led 27 delegates from across the state to Tokyo. And we had the largest turnout that we've ever had at the Friendship Association reception on the final concluding day of our trip roughly 150 to 175 Tokyo executives, businesses doing operations in, at, here in Oregon, as well as our delegation trip. It ends up being a three-day trip focused on FDI, recruitments, Oregon, communities, public officials, businesses working to try to identify where new Japanese operations can come inbound, but also, importantly, working with small and medium-sized Oregon businesses to identify new export markets, new customers for those products, and new foreign direct investment partners. One of the most interesting things I found coming out of this trip, the last two trips, was not necessarily the opportunities that are in Tokyo, a very saturated market, with very large companies who've already established North American operations. But quite frankly, our value proposition is with medium-sized manufacturing companies, small and medium-sized manufacturing companies that are family-owned in areas outside Tokyo who are looking at the demographic trends of being in Japan as a aging and declining population and trying to figure out how they drive their top line revenue growth going forward and are increasingly looking at North American expansion as an avenue into that revenue growth going forward. And where do they think when they first start making those decisions? They think about West Coast of the United States. It's an obvious direct link culturally. It's logistically incredibly efficient to get from Japan to the West Coast. Our value proposition is positioning ourselves as the cost competitive alternative on the West Coast and the best place to do business within that framework. So you'll see in parts, as I'll get to in a minute, my personal agenda included getting out of Tokyo, going to pitch nanotechnology companies in that space, family owned, outside Tokyo, transition of generational leadership at the executive position where that next generation is beginning to think about how do I grow revenue? It's not gonna be in Japan. It's going to be in the United States. I've got to figure out where that is. So true to form from previous uh, seminars, pictures are very important, I've learned. So I want to share a few pictures and what they evoke. This picture for me reminds me every time that 95% of the world's customers live outside of the United States. And when we think about how we help Oregon small and medium-sized businesses grow, the density of people, the density of opportunity in a picture like this, this is looking out one window 
of a Tokyo high-rise. I think it's where the Oregon Bar and Grill is. Everybody know we have a restaurant in Tokyo? It's pretty awesome, I think. This is looking out one window in one direction in Tokyo alone. We have a big footprint to try and cover. This is a part of the delegation that went along. Mayor Willie is in this picture, Mayor Doyle is in this picture, Council President Tom Hughes, some of our friends, Doug Smith, Mokadai's son to the right of the gentleman in the pink tie, that's Tom Hughes as you know, leads our overseas Tokyo office. The only global trade office that Oregon has anywhere in the world with full-time staff is in Tokyo, led by Mokadai's son and Sanagawa son. We don't have offices anywhere else in the world, so this is how important this relationship is to this state. But increasingly to small businesses, these are the folks who can pound the pavement, if you will, and expend some shoe leather on behalf of Oregon companies. And we want to see more deal volume go their way to help on the export side. They are there to assist you. But interestingly, this is only part of that delegation. So what happens on these trips if you haven't been, or you're thinking about how to coordinate your activities with this trip going forward? And I, and I say this because what I've seen in a year on the job is that we've got lots of delegation trips going to Japan, not always necessarily coordinated with each other. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. The good part is we're in the market. The bad part is we've got the same voice, same state, going to the same place with different messages, with different collateral at different times of year. There's an opportunity once a year in April for all of us to be there together, speaking with one voice, about Oregon, all running concurrent agendas and itineraries for what's important to us. So to give you an example, our friend Connie Stouffer, who's over here and you'll hear from in a second. First trip, Jordan Cove, everybody's heard of Jordan Cove. Jordan Cove Energy Project is a really, really important project, not only to the state, to the country, and increasingly to Japan, as it looks to diversify its energy mix following Fukushima. They're looking at potentially this being a primary source of LNG to fuel Japan's next phase of ec economic growth with energy. So Connie is on a, on a train ride one day, hour and a half, out of Tokyo, having a meeting on this very topic. I'm three hours south on a train talking to a nanotechnology company. The mayor of Hillsborough and Mark Clemens are out talking to an existing company, Tokai Carbon, to make sure that they remember that Hillsborough is number one in the world. <laughs> right, Mark? And that when they look at it, making future personnel and capital equipment decisions, investments, that Oregon, the United States, Hillsborough is where that growth happens. So all of these folks on this delegation are running parallel and concurrent agendas trying to saturate that market and come back together at key points on a critical path through these trips throughout the entire week. It becomes an incredibly effective way for the state to speak with one voice but do so in a way that hits as many people, companies, communities as possible. You'll also see here in this picture the media play. So increasingly what we're doing overseas, especially in Japan, is having a very focused media strategy and outreach. So Nikon Kogyo is a business manufacturing, small manufacturing newspaper that has a circulation of roughly 400 to 450,000 daily, I believe, daily circulation of small and medium-sized manufacturing business leaders, executives. So we're focused on creating a lot of earned media to tell the Oregon story because we can't shake enough hands to create opportunity for Oregon companies, but we can continue to extend our outreach by telling the story. And I am assured by someone that whatever is there with my picture on it says all good things. <laughs> I have no idea. Our delegation also visited the Panasonic Center. As you know, Panasonic made a significant investment uh, in the Salem area years ago in the solar industry. We continue to go back to these industries, these corporate leaders, to not only nurture the existing relationship, but again, to talk about future investment. And this year is, this year is a picture of how the event culminates with the Friendship Association uh, reception and lunch. The largest number of Japanese CEOs turn out for this event that we've had in the history of this event. And it's an opportunity for the small businesses to connect. It's an opportunity for government officials to connect and talk about why Oregon and to figure out where these industries are going into the future. 
We want to turn this into an entire week of activities next year, which is why we're having this session today to begin to coordinate that effort for next April. It may seem like a long ways off and a long ways away, but if we want to be able to build the delegation that goes, run concurrent agendas, time things so that businesses and government leaders are coming together increasingly to create a whole week of this type of activity, we need to engage more and more people. And that's part of the strategy of this agency, not only to continue on the history of this Japan relationship, but quite frankly, to take it into the 21st century, reflecting the issues and the trends that are true to Japan and true to Oregon today going forward. So with that, I want to turn it over to the folks who uh, have forgotten more about Japan than I will probably ever know. Uh, Charlie Alcock, uh, who is with PGE, but has been a long time advocate of this relationship between these two countries, long before it was popular and cool, is going to moderate a panel of folks who I think can provide a lot of insight, not just in generalities, but also on the specifics of what we saw and what we learned about where Japanese, Japan's economy is today. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. I greatly appreciate it. Sean, thank you very much for a, an excellent uh, presentation on our week. And I think you get an idea of what this week is, is all about. Um, my name is uh, Charlie Alcock. I'm the business development director at Portland General Electric. I was born and raised in Japan, came here to go to school, and Oregon State and go Beavs, and, uh, and I stayed ever since. And, and I've been an Oregonian here now for over 40 years. So um, I'd like to invite my panel up. Um, it's your panel. Uh, Tanya Fukushima, uh, Fukuyama Sari, uh, Tom DeCorsha from Business Oregon, and Connie Stouffer from the so South Coast uh, Development uh, Agency. And, um, um, and what you have here is a cross-section of first-timers born in Japan, uh, long-time resident living in Japan, has family in Japan. So, what we have here among the three and four of us is really a very diverse panel of folks that went on this business mission. And what I really wanted to do was ask these folks a few questions. Um, I also um, spent a little bit of time talk, uh, focused on energy. Since I work at PGE, I, 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 I took some time in the calendar where when I was not needed in some of the meetings and I took off and I did my separate agenda. Uh, and to hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the things that you can do next year when you go on this trip. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, energy updates uh, as we go through. But this is really your time. We have between now and about 9, 10, 9, 15, if memory serves me right. And I want them to comment uh, about, and I'll throw a few questions their way, but really I want to turn this over to you so you can ask questions of us about what we saw, what we learned, and get into more of the detail uh, that, uh, that Sean talked about uh, in his remarks. So um, let me sort of throw the first uh, uh, um, question over to uh, Connie, your first time in Japan. Um, how did the trip go? What did you learn? What were your impressions? The trip went very well. I have to be honest, when I first got the invitation to attend, I wasn't sure that I'd be able to extract enough value from my region. Nobody from my region has attended this before, and so I started off with a little hesitation. But the more I looked at it, the more I saw the value. And I have to say, after coming back, there was more that I gained than I anticipated. Um, beyond just the Jordan Cove project, there were a lot of opportunities that I hadn't fully realized for my region that could uh, materialize in Japan. And I was also just really impressed with the the connection that's been developed through the years. You could really tell that there's a relationship there between Oregon and Japan, and that was really impressive to me. So both for uh, Tamio and for um, Tom, you've been in Japan many, many years. You've seen the ups, you've seen the downs, you've seen the changes. What struck you in this trip that gives you the pause for excitement or interest or or for you to say, hey, Oregonians, these are things we need to pay attention to. So, Tom? So I spent uh, 11 years in Japan from uh, 1990, early 1990s, uh, early 2000s. And I've gone there quite a few 
time since then, just about every year. And Japan, if you read the press, looks like it's shriveled up and dried up and gone away. You go there, you go to Tokyo, you see the building cranes all, all over the town. It's a huge city, as you saw in the picture. Uh, things uh, seem to be going pretty well there. Growth has leveled off a little bit. And companies like GM and Coca-Cola, uh, of course, they're looking at China. They're looking at emerging markets. But for smaller companies that are not doing business in Japan, Japan is one really good market to look at. And I just want to emphasize that. Uh, number three in the world, uh, high expendable income, uh, high tastes. Uh, so uh, I'm really excited for the companies that are just starting to look at Japan as a market. And I'd like to emphasize that. Um, so this was my uh, third trip to Japan um, with the uh, group. Um, w what was different about this time, uh, it was interesting that I had, we had a little more collaboration of the uh, scheduling together, uh, which, was, which was really good <clears throat> in a way, but <laughs> it was uh, a little bit different from, from me because once they, the people in Japan I, I have a business with found out I was going to be there, all of a sudden, my schedule got really tight, so I didn't have a lot of time to spend with them. But that's a good thing, I think, in, in my way, because I was I was there as a private <coughs> part, uh, the participant to to the to the group. Um, one of the things that I think I noticed most this time, I've known this thing, but <coughs> um, as Sean said, there are a lot of second and third and fourth generation Japanese who have been to outside of the. Uh, outside of Japan and studied or, you know, educated, are now looking their opportunities outside of Japan a lot more than used to be, I think. One of the things that's interesting is that <clears throat> most of the clients that I met in Japan, the CEOs and people, uh, uh, the senior managers, they have been to the United States or uh, Europe and have worked before. So they're really familiar with what's going on. And especially the, the, the area that I thought are the smaller uh, business instead of the really large ones, because the large ones already have their uh, connections and everything is established, but they're, you know, either the subsidiaries or the, the supporting groups are the one that I'm really interested in here. So um, and if you look at, <clears throat> especially in my area, and we, we, you know, we, we do a lot of different kind of projects, but uh, I've been uh, dealt, I've been working with a lot of high tech companies. So, for example, we had two meetings set up this time. Uh, one was the the semi semi, which is the Semiconductor Industry Association of Japan, and also the Semiconductor Equipment uh, Suppliers Association. Uh, I thought it was really great because I walked in. The two of the CEOs of the companies that I was dealing with were sitting there. So. So that's something that was really, really nice to, to see. Um, so that, that's something that uh, uh, I think you know, we, we can really look forward to is some of these younger generation will look for opportunities outside. Sounds good, Tamio. One, uh, one of the next questions I want to ask is what kind of market intelligence did, did we pick up when we were there? Um, and let me just kind of kick off a little bit because I did look at the energy sector while I was there. Um, and, um, and you know, certainly with Japan, you have to be thinking about what's the impact of Fukushima. Um, and the earthquake and a lot of the nuclear plants are all still shut down. Um, so what they're doing in Japan is they are importing fossil fuels. They're importing um, basically a lot of uh, LNG uh, from uh, overseas sources. Um, and, and they're just really to keep the country going. There's a lot of energy efficiency measures going on. I, uh, I think all the neon signs in Tokyo have, and Japan have officially been replaced with LED lights, for example. You know, so they have done a lot of measures immediately after uh, the Tohoku uh, earthquake, the tsunami, um, and, uh, and then the Fukushima situation. Um, so you, you see that going on. But overall, you got to still remember that energy is an important part of Japan. Uh, they import most of their energy. There's not a whole lot of indigenous energy resources in Japan. So underlying a lot of the conversations is, is energy and particularly uh, electric power. Uh, and the industry is going through a tremendous deregulation now. Laws are being passed in Japan uh, to deregulate uh, the uh, electric power sector. 
The other thing that I noticed is 2020. And if you remember, 2020 is the Olympics. And it's the Olympics again in Tokyo. So there's a showcasing going on in Japan. And, countries are try and companies in Japan and the governments are really trying to showcase their technologies. So it's got a little bit of a World Expo feel to it. Um, and um, I, I, I sat through enough presentations. I was trying to figure out whether some of the stuff is real or some of it wasn't. Uh, but certainly, they're trying to demonstrate new technologies. Um, and one of those examples is hydrogen. There's a lot of talk when you go to Japan about a hydrogen society and what that means. Uh, you're seeing it in the United States, for example, with, the, with Toyota and their Mirai uh, fuel cell electric vehicle uh, and those kinds of things. So clearly, there's a lot of that kind of technology stuff that's going on. There's also a lot of work going on with smart cities and what a vision of a smart city might be. And there are a lot of companies doing demonstration projects uh, in, in, in that area. So, that's kind of some of the market intelligence I picked up on the energy side. Uh, what I like to do is, again, ask our panelists, what kind of market intelligence, strategic insights did you pick up in some of your uh, discussions and meetings? And you don't have to all answer, but Tamia, do you, do you have anything that you're walking around with as like nuggets of gold here? <laughs> well, um, as I said, I, I think there are a lot of, when you, especially in Oregon, um, if you look at the companies who are here have been working in Oregon, especially in, in areas like Hillsborough or uh, semiconductor type related uh, industries. Um, because of Intel, I think it has a lot to do with a lot of suppliers come to Oregon. Um, and because they want to have, they usually uh, develop a special type of technologies um, in Japan or somewhere else, and then they try to work out with the companies like Intel or Sony or other uh, bigger companies. Um, so the Intel part, I think that a lot of smaller companies, support kind of companies, are looking for opportunities to come here, uh, especially working with somebody like Intel or some, some uh, other big companies. Um, a, a significant reason why I went on the trip to Japan was because of the Jordan Cove project. Um, the facility is going to be located in my region, and so it obviously has a large impact on my community. But going to Japan, I really saw the impact that it could have on Japan, on Japan's economy. Um, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a third of their power was lost after the earthquake and tsunami. And so if you can imagine if we lost a third of our power, how impactful that would be on our economy. And considering that Japan is such a large trading partner and there's so many opportunities there, not only would the Jordan Cove project be really beneficial for my region, but it'll be really beneficial for Japan as well. And, and looking at the larger ripple effects of that project was enlightening. Uh, Sean showed the picture of the Panasonic Center up there. And that was a kitchen of the future that they had there. It was a little little too high tech for me, but, <laughs> but it just shows uh, they wanted to show off how different it could be from now. The thing is, Japan has been energy efficient for a number of years. They don't have their own sources of energy. so. They're very interested in what we're doing, the green economy, green building, green energy. Uh, but they actually have a lot of good technology there. They just don't know how to market it as well in the US. So that's an opportunity for us to attract businesses here to help them develop the market for some of their products. I took a tour of accessory dwelling units in, in Portland a couple weekends ago. And a lot of them are putting in these split unit air conditioning things where the one unit goes outside, the other one goes up on the wall. It works as an air conditioner or a heater. Those come from Japan. They've been using them there for 20 years. And it's really popular here now. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to bring some of that technology from Japan into the US and create jobs here in the process. Sure, can I add something? Well, one of the interesting thing is that because of the United States economy, it's been better than this past several years. What we are finding out is um, <clears throat> there are a lot of shortage of good buildings, properties, uh, especially in a lot of those small companies. That when they come here, they would like to move in and start the operation. So they look for uh, tenant improvement, TI, what we call type of spaces. And there's a little bit of shortage of that now in a lot of those areas. And again, they have to be there and strategically in certain areas to support certain things. So. That's kind of what we're seeing because of the other part of the United States. 
are also moving in here, not the Japanese companies, but the other companies. And when you look at it, there are so many other foreign companies here. I think Germany is one of them, uh, the biggest one here too. So, so Japan, people those you know come from Japan, have to kind of compete with them. So there's a little bit of shortage of the, uh, the properties. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So um, I'm gonna turn it over for questions from, from the audience. This is really your chance to ask us and I know Sean, I'm gonna volunteer Sean also if there are questions that come up for, 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 for him as well. So um, as you, any, any, uh, any questions from the audience uh, for, for our panel? And you're not being all shy at 8.40 in the morning here. Derek. So maybe you can talk a little bit uh, what sectors you see um, growth in Japanese business investment abroad if that's in the areas that are already investing here in Oregon or if there are new sectors that uh, they're starting to uh, invest more abroad and have an impact. Tom, you have Well, uh, you know, I, I think there's something that Deshaun mentioned also, the food industry is one of them. Um, and also there are specialty type of thing. There are a lot of techniques and uh, technologies developed in Japan uh, uh, trying to come, come back here. So for example, I met with one company who makes a paint. Uh, it's, a, it has a, it's an insulating paint, uh, insulation paint, so that by putting a paint on, it becomes a, uh, has a really good insulating value, uh, things like that. It's some new technology. So those are the ones that they just don't know how to get here. Uh, so, so that's one of them I saw. Uh, a lot of new technologies in you know, softwares and so on. I think there are a lot of areas that, that, that I'm, I'm not aware of. Uh, but again, like the food is another one. There are restaurants coming up here from Japan. There are several of those noodle shops started. Um, clothing, that's another thing that's uh, been here. Um, so those are the ones I can think. Yeah, Derek, maybe another way to answer that is to look at some of the underlying trends. If you look at Japan, they buy their energy at world prices, right? So they buy their oil at world prices, they buy their LNG or natural gas at world prices. Um, in the U.S., uh, we buy our natural gas at domestic prices. That's a huge difference. So anybody who is thinking about energy as a key component in whatever they're doing in business operations, clearly that's... Um, that, that's a, a, a factor in consideration. I think what you've also heard is the medium-sized businesses, right? And many of these medium-sized businesses, they have good technologies, they're good manufacturing companies, they're located outside of the Tokyo region, right? And they have a senior leadership team that is thinking about the need to get into North American markets. See, they've all done China, done it, they figured that one out. They've done Southeast Asia for, in many cases, figured that one out, done it. Now what? And that's really the question that they're facing. Is it Europe, is it Japan? Uh, is it Europe or is it North America? So there's a fork in the road. And if they go to Europe, it's a further away and those kinds of things. North America, okay, a little bit closer, but they don't have the depth in their, in many companies, in their senior ranks uh, at the director level to understand how to do business in the US, right? They don't have the language skills, they don't have the business skills. So I think that's a new kind of era of Japanese businesses looking to come here. And, and I think that's clearly something, you know, I picked up over the years the days of Sony, Panasonic, and all the global brands coming to the U.S. for the most part are over. I mean, yeah, they're going to do, they're going to keep doing things, but it, it is really now the the second, the next tier companies, as and and I think we see that here in the U.S. also of companies here trying to go over. The other thing is that, and I think I'll, I'll just, I think you guys have all seen this also, is that the questions are becoming far more generic. I mean, it used to be that somebody was looking to build a plant here, right, Tamio? They come here and they say, I want to build a factory here. 
Now it's like, well, I think about maybe a factory, but you know, I wouldn't mind doing a joint venture with somebody. Is there anybody around that I can do that with? Or hey, is there somebody, is there a company I want I can buy or somebody I can invest in? Or that thing kind of then translates into a supply chain question like, hey, the US is cheap. Can I buy stuff here in the US and use it somewhere else? So the so that's going to be another issue for us is the the, the, the question is not going to be easy to put a bracket around and a ribbon around. It's going to be moving around all over the place. And for those of us who have been doing economic development work for a long time, it's kind of like you, an inquiry comes in this way and pretty soon you're over here. How in the world do we deal with this stuff? And they don't have really the English language skills to go along with a lot of the questions. So a lot of this dialogue happens in Japanese. Sean, absolutely. The future of semiconductor which is where so much of the Oregon economy is, is, I mean, tens of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars of payroll. Quite frankly, that industry I learned is over there is thinking entirely about connected devices and the Internet of Things. And they're trying to figure out from the semiconductor and electronics manufacturing perspective how the Internet of Things affects their production, the research and technology, their supply chain, et cetera. So that conversation, I think, as a state about this is our, probably one of our most important industries in the state. It's been a legacy industry for decades, but we have to get out in front of it to figure out where it's going. So God forbid we don't wake up one morning and, and hear it's, parts of it are gone. They're thinking about it from the Internet of Things perspective and connected devices. The second big theme or takeaway, I would say, is what Charlie mentioned is joint ventures. So one of the ways these companies, I think, are looking to expand in the United States isn't necessarily to come in and do it a go-it-alone approach where they're putting their entire footprint, but they're looking for acquisitions or partnerships at the local level. So if you're a small business seeking investment capital for growth, they have cash, some of them have cash, have cash to invest into the United States as a first step towards North American expansion as opposed to a 100% risk profile where they're, they've committed alone to this market. So nanotechnology as an example, the company that I met with south of Tokyo uh, for a real pitch, uh, that's a kind of combination of all of those things. Privately held, medium size, second generation leadership in the nanotechnology space with a 50 year old technology, but they figured out that that same technology also applies to battery uh, for vehicle batteries, for the electric car industry, and they're figuring out with, say, for example, the Tesla facility in Reno, how Southern Oregon can serve as a supply chain connection into that battery facility, right? So, so it's it's kind of a it, it's not necessarily one thing as much as it's a profile. And I think the JV thing becomes an important thing for us to be thinking about. We've always thought about this as exports. Let's just sell more stuff to more Oregon uh, customers, which is true. We have to do that. Plus, how do we also attract that capital in? And it may not be in a factory the first day. It may be in that joint venture with an existing Oregon company combining the capital pool. Thanks, Sean. Any other questions? Yes. So the programs Anybody on the panel want to take that one, that question? Well, Tom? The yen is a little bit low historically. Historically, we look at what, 100, 110, 120 yen of the dollar. There was a time when the yen was high not so long ago. That was good for investment here as well as uh, selling to Japan. And, and sure, the price point 
gets a little bit, the, the margins shrink a little bit as the, as the yen goes down in value. But at the same time, the, uh, the companies in Japan benefit from the lower yen, the ones that are exporting. So they have more cash and they're able to look at their markets overseas. So usually you see one, a few categories where it's a disadvantage and then a few where it's an advantage. Oh. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the country is getting some self-confidence back. Uh, you can certainly see that. You can call it, you know, call it Abenomics, call it whatever. But, but the country is getting more confidence. And their optimism is there. Now they're saying, okay, we're at a fork in the road. We've got 2020 coming, 2025 coming. Where do we want to go? What, how do we survive in a country where the markets are naturally shrinking because of the demographics? So Japan and the population is shrinking, right? And that is not going to change. I mean, that trend is there for, for a while. So they know that for their businesses to continue to prosper, they're in a global economy, they got to get out. They've done China, they've done Southeast Asia, now where do they go? And they, they're playing this thing for the long haul. And you sort of, sort of really get that feel. They are really struggling with questions, with answers to, that, to, to, the, to those kinds of questions. And I don't think a fluctuation in the, in the exchange rate is going to affect those long-term thinking and, 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 and challenges that they're, they're, they're thinking through. Any other questions? I, want, I think I want to pick on Mark Clemens, because Mark told me a really interesting story about a meeting he had with the Semiconductor Equipment Industry Association. And you talked about a, an interesting company that showed up at that meeting. And this is semiconductor equipment, right? And one of the companies that showed up was a toilet bowl manufacturer. You want to talk about that one, Mark? You remember Toto? Did you tell me about that story? Uh, that was me. <laughs> it wasn't you? <laughs> that wasn't me. Anybody re he recognize or hear about that story? He's got one to Toto at home. <laughs> Well, this goes back to Sean's comment about the Internet of Things, Internet everywhere, and the, the way the technology is, th is changing. And you are seeing a lot of different kinds of companies showing up in traditional industry forms that used to look like this, and now we're seeing different players coming along. So, any other questions? Yes. Give you, uh, I think it's going to run the gamut depending on what type of company it is and how old and, and how much developed its technology is. In the case of the nanotechnology company I, I mentioned, as I said, that's a 50-year-old technology that was originally used in ink in a way to be able to disperse the ink in a way that didn't create a lot of bleed, if you will, but at the same time remove, I don't even know, right? It's ink, okay? They talk past me. Um, a, a, so that's not a very mature product in a fairly mature industry that's looking for diversification of revenue sources. The, for them, they have the capital necess sufficient capital to be able to make that investment into the U.S. market. High risk for them, but with the Reno plant five hours away of Southern Oregon for Tesla, a manageable risk. In the case of a different example, and I uh, show a chemical, uh, is a, a Japanese uh, acquisition of technology that I believe Skip came out of through your shop, through Onami. So it, it, their growth profile was to acquire a technology that was developed through the innovation ecosystem of the state. So it's not necessarily directing, uh, investing in the startup to your question itself, as much as it's acquiring the technology and then figuring out how to fuel the growth here locally 
in terms of its manufacturing expansion. So I think, I know I'm not putting too fine a point on it because I don't think there's a one size fits all structure for how those partnerships are gonna be formed. It's gonna be a pretty big. Let me wrap it up by, um, by saying, you know, Ajinomoto was the case study. We had a, uh, the, the president of Ajinomoto Frozen Foods be our keynote speaker at the seminar. And you know, he talked about coming to the United States first and thinking about you know, making product here for export back to Japan. Right? And within six months, nine months, he said, oops, you know, that strategy isn't going to work. Uh, there's a population here in the US that loves uh, ethnic foods. We're going to make stuff here and sell it in the US. Right? Talk about a 180 degree flip. And now what they've done is they've, they've consolidated some of their research uh, here in, in Oregon. And uh, they went on a, on a buying uh, sort of spree to, to, to speak of, and they decided that they wanted their own uh, supply, uh, own distribution chain, and they bought capacity uh, with a uh, food processing company based in Texas that has a footprint into the southeast. So, you know, things change, and the, the, I think the whole nature of our experience the last uh, this trip, and we've been watching it, but this one really struck home, is that these, the, the, the kinds of deals and the kinds of questions that are coming up are really changing. And even in the middle, in the middle of a conversation, they do move around. So with that, please join me in thanking the panel, and uh, we're switching over to the next session. Charlie, thanks very much, and thanks to the panel. That was a great summary of, of the mission and observations and opportunities. I really loved Sean's uh, description, if you will, the imagery of uh, Sean being three hours south and Connie being an hour and a half west. And, and that really is a great example of how this mission um, has evolved. Uh, and one of the things I really want to thank uh, Janet Labar from Greater Portland, Inc. Uh, uh, was part of a partnership that uh, came on this trip, and Matt Miller uh, is here. I think Alyssa is here. Derek is here from Greater Portland Inc. Sheila is here. Um, but one of the, the advantages of having Greater Portland Inc. on this trip this time was that we reached out to industry associations and banks and technology consultants in a way that we used to do about 20 years ago but hadn't done on a consistent basis. And for example, we met with uh, Deloitte, which does, everybody knows the Fortune 500. Deloitte does uh, a technology fast 500 in each region of the world. And really thanks to the legwork and research of Matt Miller at GPI, we got in the door to meet with the, the senior vice president at Deloitte in Japan who puts that together for all of Asia. Uh, and so we're, we were talking with uh, the guy who's evaluating and identifying who's the next biotechnology leader, who's the next software leader, who's the next Internet of Things leader. And so that was a great, that wouldn't have happened without uh, Greater Portland Inc. being a part of that. The other really great meeting we had was with Bank of America. Uh, and uh, again, that was through a board member of Greater Portland Inc. here in town. Uh, but uh, we were in front of their senior economist, who we were told later is most likely to be on the Bank of Japan, our Federal Reserve equivalent um, Board of Governors, uh, potentially next year, giving us his uh, view on the Japanese economy. And one of the things that he pointed out, uh, to your point, was uh, the cash reserves of uh, Japanese corporate sector currently is kind of un, uh, you know, it's just, it's amazing currently. And so the opportunity uh, for Japanese companies and the partnerships, as Sean said, it's going to be diverse. It's going to be uh, things we haven't even thought of before. Um, and so it's, I think the, the opportunity in Japan is significant. Um, and the other really exciting thing about this mission this year and in recent years, again, is the diversity of engagement and involvement. Uh, it's not just guys like me in suits who are uh, you know, on this mission, but really thanks to Mitsu uh, Yamazaki from Portland Development Commission, he's engaged um, a whole other aspect of our economy uh, for which Portland is really regard highly regarded in Japan. Uh, and he's energized uh, 
the pop-up PDX, the, the artisan manufacturer, the, the folks who craft things with their hands with these beautiful bikes and beautiful um, artwork and greeting cards from Egg Press. So the next section of this, of this morning uh, is really to highlight that aspect of our economy, and I want to introduce my good friend Mitsu Yamazaki from Portland Development Commission. Morning. A quick question. How many people are still awake? Good, good. Um, I'm going to invite our panel over from Pop Up Portland event, Ken and Kara and Tess. And we have name tag. Awesome. You can. I'm Ken today. All right. And, uh, oh. Is this the clicker? It's okay. On. It's on. It's on. And that's not on yet. You have to turn it on, but leave it on if you like. All right. Again, so um, all the talks prior to me had happened in one week, and so many meet. I don't know, two dozen meetings probably, and um, then. Second week, so it was actually Oregon two weeks. Second week, we actually had a, a pop-up Portland event from Monday through Friday in a venue called uh, Much Acute. And uh, everybody gathered around in Tokyo just for the um, Friends of Oregon reception, which usually happens in the third Saturday of um, April every year. And uh, so the pop-up team joined that with the entire delegation, had a great time drinking at 11 o'clock in the morning at the Oregon Bar and Grill downtown Tokyo with a view that Sean shot. It's great. <laughs> Life is good. And then on Sunday, we took it, um, basically a, a market tour because some of the companies, we had eight companies participated, some of the companies hadn't been to Japan, and we have to show them not only good times, but also um, the, how the market works, what that retail environment is like, what the industry is looking for, what the trends are like today. So we did that all day tour, and um, with help of a few volunteers in Tokyo, we just dragged them around all over Tokyo. And there wasn't enough time, was it? No. All right, so I'm gonna put some context of the, um, the week and the event, and I'm gonna go into some questions, and then I'll open up a Q&A. So why we started, the context. So in 2012, Portland was selected as pilot city for, well, one of four pilot cities for Obama's um, export initi national export initiative. And uh, we came up with our own uh, business plan for export to double our export production in five years. And at the time, Sean was actually the CEO of Greater Portland Inc. And he, along with uh, a few people from Metro and PDC, led the task to create the big goals. And one of the strategies was to really brand Portland globally, so brand our competitive advantage. So that was the green building. So we came up with this brand called We Build Green Cities. Fast moving forward, we had a few good wins in, in Japan. We've taken um, several companies from Portland metro region, architects, engineers, sustainable consultants, um, landscape designers, planners, all those companies who've won contracts in, in and around Tokyo. Some of them are $2 billion uh, project. The fee is smaller than $2 billion, I'll tell you. Uh, but, but some significant projects. So there are successes. And then, of course, you know, our superiors and bosses are like, OK, we broken cities have worked. What's next? Japan is ready. So the next task was to create, um, look for something new that we can still sell in, Portland, uh, in Japan from Portland. And some of the media coverage we, we have been getting for the last, I'll say, three, four years are getting bigger and bigger. So I've put some of the magazines on that table if you'd like to look at. Um, second one from your right, Popeye, they've had an entire monthly issue on Portland. It's the third largest economy in the world focused on medium-sized town in the US. 
they could focus on anywhere, but they had that kind of zip focus. So what is about that attract that we attract from uh, Japan? So we've been discussing internally and then strategize, okay, it's the lifestyle, it's the fashion, it's the makers, it's the sustainability, it may be the water, it may be beer. So we figure out that we want to maybe take some of that cool stuff from Portland to Japan as some of these magazines covered. So we've, this is our second year. First year we've taken nine companies and we did it one day at two locations. So two days of a pop-up event in Kyoto and Tokyo last year. It was a previous success, but it was the first year we're trying to figure out. Lessons learned. So second year we've taken even better companies. Did I say that? Even better companies. No offense to Dan, who went last year. He did great too. So we've taken eight one, two, three, four, seven, but eight brands. And uh, so last one from the bottom is, has two brands in one company. And even King, who has established in Japan already, uh, joined us. So um, we wanted to show off our brands, how, how things work, but really our overall um, goal was to create more business-to-business -business connections, long-term relationship, and along the way, sales and marketing. This is a venue. It's called Machi Cute. It's a 101 year old um, train station that's been converted to event venues and restaurants and coffee shops and um, pop up venue. And I'm going to cover some of these things, but you know, you, you, you're going to, they, they're going to talk about these uh, parts. So um, I'm going to ask around uh, um, a round of questions and you guys answer and um, we'll go back and forth for maybe three five questions and then we'll go turn out to the uh, questions from the audience so this is came from Lenovo I would like you to talk about your yourself and the company first and then we'll go on we make wooden bicycles oh I know that's odd <laughs> but uh, they are, to the extent possible, high technology. They're CAD-CAM purely, made on CNC machines, designed uh, computer design, SolidWorks, AlphaCAM, and the rest. Uh, a great deal of testing, both prior to manufacture and after the completed products. Uh, we've had them compete worldwide in the World Ironman Championships, the Race Across America, and many other events. So yeah, they're wood and unusual, but they're legitimate bicycles. Who's that in the picture with you? That is my son, Stuart. Uh, who was on the trip? With, uh, he and I developed these bikes together uh, one summer between when he graduated from college and went off into the Marine Corps. He now flies the uh, Harrier jump jet. And unfortunately, I wish he'd quit fooling around with the airplanes. We need him back here. He's a smart guy, helps a lot. So we had a great time. He and I went uh, a little bit early for the event and spent 10 days in Japan. And we both want to live there and abandon Portland, frankly. OK, we'll, we'll ask you more about that. Um, this is a burning question in the audience. How, so how much are the bikes? How much which? How much are the bikes? How much are the bikes? <laughs> well. Uh, uh, from about five thousand to about fourteen thousand dollars. All right, uh, line up, please. They're for sale. <laughs> All right, um, Tess, tell me, tell us about yourself and how the company started. Um, I started Egg Press almost sixteen years ago, and um, I think. Egg Press represents the lowest tech of all of, <laughs> of everything that we've been talking about. We're a letterpress greeting card manufacturing company. Um, I left my job at Nike. I'd been there for five years, straight out of college, and um, spent a lot of hours at the studio when I wasn't working, and decided, sort of by accident, to start manufacturing greeting cards. Um, we are sold in about a thousand stores in the U.S. and over the years have grown um, significantly. We're still a small company. There are 20 people working at Egg Press, 14 full-time and six part-time. Um, we started 
selling to Japan uh, three years ago through a Business Oregon grant. Um, we worked with Alexa Hamilton and um, had two trade shows through Business Oregon. One, the first year was trying to figure out how to establish ourselves in Japan. We'd never, we, we knew that we would do well there, um, but we weren't sure how to go about it. And it became clear in the first, the very first um, trade show that we needed to distribute. We, we had to have a distributor. Um, so once we established a distributor, and that, and that was, we had incredible help through Business Oregon to get um, just for the communication, logistics. So um, once we were established, then we went to another trade show uh, with our new distributor. And that was also, we also had help from Business Oregon that time. The third time was, and, and it was three, three years in a row, um, the third time was on this trip, which okay. was probably the, the in terms of um, more meaningful communication, this was a home run. It was, um, it was the first time we felt like we, I mean, we, there wasn't an evening where we didn't have plans. We had, we've established a lot of friendships there. And the more, I, I feel like we're integrating ourselves more and more. And I think that's, that's leading to much bigger conversations th that same kind of conversations we'd be having here. Um, and, and a lot of media coverage, even just since the, since the event. So, um, okay. Right, we're really excited about the so, opportunity. Um, speaking of media coverage, uh, that's Kelly Anagawa. She's one of the designers, and the, well, I would say one of the top designers of green cars in the US. <laughs> what happened to the media coverage when you came back, when Obama was visiting? Well, I mean, Tess could probably speak to uh, her visit with the president a little bit more. Um, <laughs> But um, since we've been back, we've had, um, we were in the True Portland Guide, which I don't know if that happens sort of subsequent to the trip or since we got back. Um, there was an article published in Mono Magazine, and then um, there's an article, uh, Yayoi, who I think is here somewhere, um, she's working on for um, Nice Things, which I think is a newer yeah. publication. But yeah, Tess um, got a chance to meet the president. And I think it was... It. I'll give you two minutes. No, no. <laughs> I remember nothing. It was, it was really incredible. But, but it sort of seemed yeah. like it was in direct relation to yeah. the trip. Yeah, sure. I had a call from the, tr the trade office to talk about our trade, um, just our trade experience in the last three years with Japan and, and, and how we export and how if we, if, you know, if TPP were to pass, how how are that could you know what opportunities that might mean for our company it was interesting to learn about it because uh, tess was a designer at nike and when president obama was speaking at nike about advocating tpp uh, he gave a shout out about tess and her success in japan and joking about how nice the cars were <laughs> and has to be translated into Japanese, which is not true, but uh, that was funny. Uh, so there's an online video about it. It didn't go viral, only at PDC. Um, <laughs> so um, what are some of the challenges you encounter in Japan, either in the past or this time? Ken? Any challenges? It's all a challenge, Japan. God, everybody here has been there a lot, not us. Right, we, that was your first sold trip. bikes all over the world from South Africa to Nova Scotia, Alaska, Belize, the jungle, Singapore, everywhere, but not Japan. And we felt that there was an affinity with the craftsmanship, the wood, the joinery, all of this stuff. We'd be a natural for Japan. Never sold one bike in Japan. So how many have you sold so far in Japan? Five. Five of them? Five so, times 10,000, 20,000? <laughs> but the key thing, so probably everybody here in the room knows Muji. So when Muji emailed us a year ago, I thought, uh, oh, spam. <laughs> See, Muji? Come on, Muji? Nah. But uh, so I read the email a little more carefully, and uh, they wanted to come visit. 
us, our little company in Portland. So they did. For those who don't know, it's a department store with some 650 stores worldwide. Uh, they started in Tokyo. Their uh, operations center is really in Singapore. Uh, stores in the US now. So we met with them again in Tokyo. And our intention when we went to Japan was thanks to these guys who supported us so many ways uh, from a cultural understanding of what we're up against to how to ship things over there and get them back. All of these things, we had no clue about Japan, which is different than almost anywhere else, purely from the language barrier and the cultural barrier. I'm from California, and patience is not one of my virtues. Japan is all about patience. Take your time. It'll happen after a while. So these guys, three years, uh, for us, one trip is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, we met with Muji again in Tokyo. They came back after the Tokyo trip and met with us in Portland again. They like more of our products. They want us to do a particular bike for them to suit their economy because of the $5,000 problem that Mitsu brought up. Uh, we need less expensive bikes over there. They're all about sustainability, uh, the environment, all of that. That's a hallmark for Muji, which is what they like about our bikes, sustain sustainable products. So it's a huge learning experience. Oh my God, and we never would have done it without these guys, never. Wouldn't even consider it. I mean, it's just not possible. <laughs> there were translators there for us. The, the translators would take over. We don't need. We could have gone and had lunch or beer or something. <laughs> they were selling the bikes. Uh, yes, they handled they everything for us. It was amazing. We, uh, we had a whole bunch of students who could um, translate for us, but they also became sales rep for everybody. <laughs> Did they ever? <laughs> They're former PSU and Oregon grads or um, exchange students who are now in, back in Japan. Yeah, an amazing so, group. And um, for. Egg press. What were the highlights for sales and new connections? In a, maybe a few minutes. Yeah. We, um, I think the highlight was not some. It, one of the highlights was what Ken was saying about there. There, it was. It, it really, even though we've been there three years, it is still just the very beginning. And um, I think one of the highlights was was discovering that it really it's, it, it is a game of patience and um, and I think that that once once you that is really the once you realize that is the reality you're working under I think it makes things a lot easier once since we've gotten back we've um, we've slowly you know made progress with some uh, from some of the conversations we've we had while we were there. Um, the other thing, I, I think also realizing that we're becoming more integrated there than we mm -hmm. ever expected. We had dinners with people. We've been doing kind of exchanges, just um, impromptu exchanges with people we've met from Japan and people who have introduced themselves by email and said, well, I'm coming to Portland, can, we, can I have a tour? And I think we've done so many tours with, um, people we've met in Japan are people who have introduced themselves who are coming to Portland. And I think that building those relationships are, that's incredible. That's, that's a really, um, it's part of this building, a, you know, building a foundation in Japan that it is slow, it's slow, but it's, um, I think it's, it's legitimate. It's, um, it's meaningful. And um, that's, that's a huge takeaway from, um, from our experience, we also had some great conversations with uh, some a couple existing accounts, but um, in bigger ways than ever. So mm. I think along with that, I mean, what the pop up allowed us to do was um, the venue, uh, the translators, and um, the amount of time, and also. Um, the sort of matching that the PDC did ahead of time 
uh, really facilitated those meaningful conversations. So there was enough you know, space and time to have those conversations. There were the translators to help us like really understand each other. Um, and you know, when you go to a tra traditional trade show, it's all about sort of the quick, sort of here's what we do, and you know, introducing yourself. But you don't really have that time to cultivate those relationships. Good. Um, I have a couple more questions, and I'll open up. Um, are, are there any advice for Oregon small businesses if they're interested in Japan? Can you give them any advice now if they haven't been to Japan? Start early. Start early, that's a good one. Uh, persevere. It's a long, I mean, we've been dealing with Muji. So Muji has overtaken us. I mean, okay, so we're a flea on the back of an elephant, but uh, <laughs> and that investment thing comes up. And, uh, I mean, I'm, we're nervous about dealing with Muji. It's so huge. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just taken so long, and we've, but as we go along, we meet people from this department, from that uh, office, uh, a whole range of people, a whole range of dinners and meetings, and what a joy to deal with they are. I mean, they're great, but it just takes a long time, a lot of yeah. I's to dot and T's to cross okay. for them, more than for us. Yes, we'll do it. Well, slow down. <laughs> okay. Same question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I I think I, I would second that that patience and just um, don't expect it to be the same pace you're used to. Um, but I th I think really understanding your opportunities there is that's that's another piece of advice I'd give. I think that um, it just for us it was a natural fit. But I think we're starting to realize that there are a lot of other uh, collaborations to be had that um, wouldn't necessarily present themselves here. So I think educating ourselves on that is, um, has, is, has been smart. Yeah, how about your gen general um, lessons, but also from aesthetic and design standpoint? Um, well, I, Tess and I have been big fans of um, Japanese design and textiles and um, that sort of thing for a long time, and I would feel, I would say that there's a kinship between quality in Japan um, that I think that we appreciate, in addition to um, just really nice, clean design. Okay, and my final question: How do PDC organization pop up and business Oregon step grant help you? Give us the ways that that helped, and maybe some improvements that you think we could do for you guys in the future. We would never have gone to Japan without you guys, period. Maybe next time. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it was just, uh, I mean, it's just a beginning. Tom mentioned that, Tom DeCorsia, earlier. Uh, this was a beginning. Uh, if we hadn't had Muji, which they came to us, so we can't take credit for that, uh, Penetrating the distribution market of cycling in Japan is going to be a long haul. Ain't easy. Uh, it's a very closed, tight uh, yakuza of bicycle <laughs> distribution. So that's going to be tough. Uh, but uh, the relationships that you build grow and grow, and pretty soon you worm your way in step by step. I think it's, I mean, I love it, actually. It's a great game over there, and the people are amazing. I love Japan. I, th I think we wouldn't, I, I would also say that we wouldn't have been as, we, we would have loved to have gone, but I think the step grant kind of put, put you know, sent us, it was a, the nudge we needed to really make it happen, and the support of, um, Sunagawa-san in Japan, in the Business Oregon Japan office, has, I mean, I, I don't know what we would have done without him on that first trip. So, and, and um, this last trip, everything was so mapped out and so organized, and um, I, I think that so much of the setup, the pre, the, all the work that was done ahead of time, 
m made it so much easier. Um, so much easier. We, there's just no way that we could have made that same impact on, on our own at all. Hear that? I, I would agree. The resources um, from both Business Oregon and the PDC have been amazing uh, resources. And I think that while we could have sort of stumbled through on our own, it was really nice to have, you know, to know um, like what's appropriate and um, to have um, Sunagawa-san accompany us on some of our business dinners because, you know, we're, we're women that don't know the culture, and it's just nice to sort of have, um, have that base mm. of knowledge, that resource. It's the price. Yeah, we had price. one meeting mm -hmm. with you guys just about Japanese business culture. How do we do that? What's it like? Yeah. Uh, without those things. That was like 30 minutes. business meeting. card, you know? Yeah. yeah. 30 me me meeting wasn't enough, but yes, that was a start. <laughs> all right, now, before you guys fall asleep, I'm going to open up to audience questions. Go ahead. Japan is a bicycle society, so I'm going to assume that, but they're not a greeting card society. This room is a relatively new um, endeavor for a lot of businesses. So how is a greeting card society in Japan different? Um, I've been shocked at how little we've had to do. I, th I think that's um, that's been huge to, to realize that we're selling uh, a to our distributor. We probably sell eighty to ninety percent of our line as it exists with no changes. Um, we have done some exclusives with Loft, which is a store. It's sorry. It's hard to really describe Loft, but it's um, it's a department store. They have about a hundred doors in Japan, and the the only um, real diversion from our line has been the the post uh, an exclusive line of postcards that we've done with them, and um, it's it started out as twenty four pieces, and we're talking about they they'd like to expand it to fifty six pieces. Um, it, we, on this last trip, we, um, so we have, we really toot the horn of the, the value of handwritten notes. And, um, I think that well, that's been something we're focused on in the U.S. And we've had a lot of interest in Japan about the same, the same concept. And I think that, um, well, well specifically, Tokyo Hand Store was asking if we might have a um, we did right a, on campaign. Yeah, we did a campaign did in the U.S. Yeah. two years in a row, um, where we gave away. This year, we gave away five thousand free kits to help facilitate people writing letters to one another. And I think that um, maybe globally, there's a craving, especially I mean, in, you know, um, more first world countries where electronic communication takes over. I think that there's a similar craving for um, handwritten letters. There's also been a, a lot more awareness about letterpress in, in general. Um, mm -hmm. In the last five years, quite a few books have been written in Japan about letterpre letterpress craft, where uh, um, maybe the same was happening in the U.S. When I first started Egg Press 16 years ago, there were just two or three hand two or three letterpress companies um, doing greeting cards. And um, and I think Japan is kind of a little bit behind on the, the trend. I don't know if it's necessarily a trend, but um, there's a new appreciation for letterpress in Japan. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yep. Our first baby step is just to understand the Japanese customer better. I think we'll try to attract some of the Japanese tourists in first. But my question is, um, were there any common questions that you got who showed up to the pop-up store? And were there any surprising questions about 
Do I take that? Ken? Kara? I mean, I, I don't know if there were any surprising questions about Portland, but what I did, um, I did understand that we were very much um, ambassadors. So, you know, maybe they might ask about our line and talk to us about what we were doing, but they really wanted to know about Portland as well. So it felt like Portland itself is a brand, and we were sort of not only representing our own brands, but the brand of Portland. Mm. Anything to add, Ken? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> All right, a few more questions? Nothing to add to that. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And my question is on price point. I think my lip balm retails here for two ninety nine, and there it's like for seven hundred and something. Again, Jeez. Around seven dollars. So do you see a similar? How does your retail price point compare here to there? Is that normal, or is that? We um, we have a pretty typical distributor price break, which is half of wholesale. So we're taking a big cut on our margins, but we're, I mean, the volume is a lot different. Um, so it, it sort of makes up for it. And with letterpress, there might be, I, I think lip balm and letterpress are probably <laughs> pretty different. So we can afford to take those cuts because really when, when you're printing volume, it just makes it that much easier to, to absorb. I did notice when we were there, we took, um, we have a line of um, goods called Social Preparedness Kit, and it's tools to help keep in touch. And so some of it is um, screen printed fabric that we print in house and we sew, um, you know, pencil pouches and bags and such. And I did f see that, like, of all the bags, the pencil pouches didn't get as much attention, and probably because the price point was a little bit high for Japan. And I think probably because they use pencil pouches a lot, you can get pencil pouches at the dollar store. So right. in, in that way, like maybe, you know, craft isn't so important. It's more the function of the, of the item. But that's the only place that I really saw that the price point was maybe an issue is the one item. Yeah. And also the, the type of distributor you're working with, if they're national and they are into a bunch of uh, small retail shops, then that's one thing. If they're into higher end department store, that's a totally different game. So you have to work with various types of distributors to get into different markets. So that dictates the price points every time. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, being with the Japanese company that actually launched the product in Japan, uh, we're, we're also very Uh, we've uh, been to Japan for the last two years trying to launch a product that's made uh, And I'm interested to find out as you get connections with distributors or wholesalers, uh, are, you, are you looking for the exclusive or are you finding that once you get started, you have a number of different distributors that are interested in your products? Or how is that philosophy? If a few minutes to answer. I, th I think it varies. Um, from company to company, but our experience, we were taking our sub-brand, the Social Preparedness Kit brand, which we didn't think our distributor was interested in. It turns out that they were. But um, in our case, I think it's just a lot simpler and more straightforward. We can focus all of our energy into that one relationship, and um, it's it's just a lot simpler to, sh you know, to ship to one one location, one pallet and um, well, greeting cards packed down pretty small. Um, but uh, that is a decision that we, that we made. There were other opportunities and people that were interested in say like, can we take your product and take it into this market? Or you know, can we go more of a fashion direction? Um, but we chose to stick with our original distributor and, and um, see how it goes with them. Uh, dis distribution in Japan is weird for bicycles. Uh, <laughs> I hate to say it. Uh, we contacted, as did these guys, uh, all of them prior to going there. Not one agreed to meet with us. Not one. Uh, uh, well, they, they came to the event, but... Not one distributor. 
Yeah. The only one that came, yeah, the, so, so that goes back to what Tess was saying. Yeah, there's a range of them. Mm -hmm. So there are some very small distributors. And of course, the big time guys, well, we like to ship pallets of stuff too. Yeah. That's the way to do it. So uh, uh, it's going to take more trips to Japan to really understand what's going on with all of that. I don't know. Uh, I have heard from people in Japan that it is very tightly controlled and uh, mm -hmm. narrow in the whole bicycle thing. So uh, that remains to be seen. Sure does raise my interest in Muji. Mm. Good. OK. Um, just a final wrap of thought, but um, Japan is getting ready for Olympics. The, they are still putting billions of dollars for rebuild. Uh, Japanese yen devaluation, about 20, 25%, have been occurring, but that hasn't prevented them uh, from, from buying more stuff from Oregon and US and other countries because of the higher uh, value added products and the uniqueness of our products. So there are opportunities for many kind of products, but we have to remember always that Japan really values the face-to-face, in-person relationship building, and without traveling, it will not happen. And uh, right buyers are not usually traveling to Portland. That uh, younger folks or maybe salespeople for traveling through Portland or government folks traveling through the urban studies tours, but not the right buyers or CEOs. So you really have to pay attention to meeting the right person and talk about the right message of what you're trying to sell. And that's important. And that's what we, as PDC, that's what we really learned from these pop-up trips. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. Mitsu, Ken, Tess, Kara, thank you very much. Uh, I think one of the things that's been most exciting about this morning is to, to give you all a chance to be introduced to the kind of resources that are available here in our community. Um, one that hasn't been recognized yet, uh, but uh, one of the things that these resources do is open doors for you in, uh, in Japan or in other countries that, uh, where we have relationships. But one of the really special resources here in our community is the Consular Office of Japan, uh, and we're graced by the Consul General Hiroshi Furusawa and also his Deputy Consul General Izima-san uh, is here who does the economic side. Um, but I want to thank them for being here this morning and for the doors that they open, um, kind of behind the scenes things that um, many of us who are on these missions we don't quite see, but uh, there's a lot of really good work that takes place. Um, so thank you very much, Consul General. Um, with that, I want to invite our closer. Uh, uh, to come up and uh, share just some closing remarks uh, uh, about this morning and hopefully uh, motivate us to, uh, for greater things in the future. Sean Robbins, Business Oregon. Motivate. <laughs> so uh, in October, coming up, we will be uh, taking another trade mission back to Asia with a very uh, focused stop back in Japan, governors leading a trade mission back. Uh, we'll be also be going to China, uh, to Vietnam, as well as part of this. But obviously, Japan is a critical stop on our path. I would encourage all of us as a community to begin thinking about how all of us can be coordinating our activities, business and government, around the set dates on a regular basis so that again, as a presence as a state, we speak with a louder voice than our footprint might otherwise allow. I think what I'm uh, quite frankly humbled about with the presentation that Tess and Kara and Ken gave is these guys really personify what we're trying to do within state government about growing our own. Because every time we help them drive a new sale, it potentially unlocks the ability for these companies to grow profits and to eventually add jobs in these communities. That's what we are about. How we play in that space within global trade. As a state, I look at it as trying to build a bridge. I can't sell the product for them. They have to sell their product, or PSU students translating can sell your product. <laughs> 
Government can't sell the products. Government can't create the jobs. But we can provide the bridge for these things to happen. And I think what the PDC has done exceptionally well is then take and localize that approach in building their companies and taking them and setting up with those unique agendas within markets. We create the bridge at the state, the local community, and the businesses themselves work to identify very detailed agenda opportunities ahead of time. The more precise you are, the more prepared you are, the better, in fact, you're going to be at succeeding in a market like Japan. And to the point on patience, if you say you're going to come back to Japan, you've got to come back to Japan. They remember. They remembered when I promised upon taking the appointment at an event here in Portland that my first stop as the director of this agency would be in Japan. It was in Japan. They remembered that it's Japan. I promised when I was in Japan that I would be back in April. They remembered that I said I would be back in April, and they're glad I was. And it's that repetition over time that builds the trust in the relationship, not just at the business level, but also at the government level, for us to be able to help open more of those doors for our businesses to succeed. So I appreciate the partnership that we've created at the local level, at the state level, and we really want more engagement from businesses and NGOs across this state to continue to grow our presence in this market going forward. And to the extent we can unlock new businesses who are looking to sell and cross-sell within those markets, we have tremendous resources available, some of which were touched on, that we want to do more of in partnership with all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. Go about your day and go sell something. Thank you.